So we know that there's variation within, a, within all populations. Look across the room, we've got tall people, short people, wide people, skinny people. And the same happens with goats, or any livestock for that matter. There's always variation in a population. I'm a tall white Australian uh, male, does that make me a good fast bowl of a cricket? No, it doesn't. Just because you're a Kalahari or a boar, does that mean that you're going to have bigger carcasses? No, it doesn't. Uh, just because you're a rangeland though, does it mean you're going to have triplets every year? No, it doesn't. There will be some that have triplets, there will be some that lose. So this is what genetics is about. So I'd just like to acknowledge there are several different uh, goat management systems. Uh, there's the wild harvest, the semi-managed and the managed. Now if, we're in a, if you're in a wild harvest situation, then a lot of this uh, won't apply to you at home on farm. But for those who are in a semi-managed or a managed, those who are buying bucks, uh, this is highly applicable to you. So uh, several years ago, this young man and anyone who's watched Napoleon Dynamite would see that that's akin to the glamour shot. Um, but this guy, uh, before falling in love and moving to the Netherlands, uh, dedicated three and a half years of his life to have a look at the genetic variation in the goat population. You can read the report if you search that. Um, that there. And he concluded that the key profit drivers um, from a genetic sense in, in a self-replacing herd, and this Gordy's not crazy, the top one is kid survival. No kids, you've got nothing to sell. Next was conception, litter size, growth, and then a worm burden. So, from a genetic perspective, um, how can we improve that? How do we go and find some bucks to that will take our, our, our flock forward or herd forward in these key traits? Kid survival, when we're eyeballing a buck in the sale yards, can you tell me that how well that buck's progeny will survive out in the paddock? Can you tell me how well those buck's daughters will conceive? How fertile are they? Can you tell me how many, um, uh, how big the litter size will be on that buck's daughters? If you can, come and, come and talk to me. So we know performance is a combination of genetics and environment. So a question I often ask is, um, often if we averaged all the, all the performance of an animal, whether we're talking reproduction, growth, um, structure. If genetics was 25% of the performance of the animal and environment was, so management, um, what they eat and how much it rains, um, how old was the mother. If 25% came down to genetics, are you guys spending 25% of your managerial time on genetics? And of course the answer is no. You never expect the answer to be no but it should be a little bit more than turning up to sale day on the morning, eating a few scones and saying, oh, that one's all right. Oh, that one, it's 600 bucks, so that'll do the job. So let's, let's stretch out what, what environmental factors impact a, um, the performance of an animal. Feed, massive one. So feed is, can be either supplementary fed or it can be supplied out in the paddock and what's available in the paddock is dictated by climatic conditions, season, rainfall, um, fertiliser, all those things. Dam age, you pay, pay a, maiden, uh, a maiden doe tax, so we know that uh, maiden does have smaller, smaller kids, and we know that um, uh, mature, mature does will have bigger kids. We know that single borns and single raised will be bigger than uh, twins or triplets. And the other thing is the age of the animal. We can have two animals, two animals that are 20 kilos, one's five months old, one's three months old. Which one would you take? The one that's taken a lot shorter time to get there, provided the cost is the right price, John. Now, genetics, my area of passion. Genetics of an animal, it's set of fertilisation. We get half our genetics from mum, half our genetics to dad, fertilisation, 
those genetics combine and creates an embryo and it never changes from that point in time. Same for all you guys, same for your kids, all the rest of it, and it's permanent. The cool thing about genetics is that if we can start improving the genetic merit of animals for particular traits and your breeding objective that increase your on-farm profitability, we improve year on year, it's like interest at the bank. We can go up, up, up. So it's $2 this year, it's $4 next year. $6, $8, and then we start to see the nest egg build in the genetic improvement of animals. So what do you get when you purchase a buck? Well, I'm telling you right now, you don't get the feed bin that you bought the buck from. What you're buying is uh, two things. One is the animal's ability to get uh, does in kid. And the second part is the, genetic, the genetics that the buck passes on. So this is a really important one. If we've got the worst buck in the world and the best buck in the world, and the best buck in the world, if we're talking about the genetic merit, can't get an animal in, in kid, but this one can get a thousand in kid, well, that's a far more profitable buck to be buying than this one. Now, if both bucks are getting the same amount of progeny, well, obviously this is the more productive, more profitable buck. So here we have, we've got three bucks, three real life examples. Buck one, buck two, buck three. Now let's just take our breed blinkers off and look at the individual. And there are the real prices. These are the prices paid at a sale wherever the pointer is, uh, 1900, 1100 and 3400. Now, is anyone bold enough to tell me which buck is the most profitable buck? Have a crack. You won't, you either get it or you don't. There's no science behind it. Number two. Oh, you're going a bit of reverse psychology. I put the cheapest one on there. Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you that buck one weans kids one kilo heavier than buck two. Buck three, we don't know anything about. Buck three is our raffle ticket. Now, buck one daughters wean 13% less kids than buck two. Again, we don't know anything about buck three, but we paid three times the amount for him. So, but how do I know that? Am I just talking out of my bum or what's going on? <laughs> so, I know this because buck one and buck two have estimated breeding bees. So, they came from a stud who collect data and we can use that data to create breeding bees. I'll go into that uh, in a bit. But at birth, buck one, his kids are half a kilo heavier than buck twos. The uh, post weaning weight, there's that kilo difference. But here's the real kicker. Number of lambs born, there's a 17% difference. The third one, we've got no idea. And you'll probably have, never have any idea because you're not measuring things at home. But because he looked pretty, we paid three, $3,400 for him. Now, the other part I want to say is, yes, when you're going to a buck sale, the physical, um, how they look, they need to be functional, they need to have good feet, be able to get around, nice square jaw so they can eat, and all those um, fancy stud things. So let's move on to the breeding values. How are they calculated? What are we doing here? So breeding values take into account who mum and dad are, so stud breeders um, in and this is every species in the world, sheep, pigs, chicken, dairy, the whole lot. We're all, to be able to get breeding values, we need to know who mum and dad is. We need to be measuring the animals. So breeding values are simply a deviation from the cohort <laughs> average. It's not about the overall average. It's not about, well, you know, here are my big bucks that have been on a grain bin for four months and they average 90 kilos. As a geneticist, what I'm interested in, well, that's cool. What's your deviation? Go and find me your one that's 95 kilos. Point me out the one that's 75 kilos, is 20 kilos below the uh, cohort average. 
we take out all that environmental white noise. So we can account for that. So if we know if they're, uh, um, if they're born at the start of May, if they're born at the end of the drop in the middle of um, June, um, we, we, we can take into account whether they're out of a maiden or out of a mature ewe. Uh, we then take into account uh, the progeny's performance and we measure them in large cohorts. So they run under the same environmental conditions. So we run them all out in that paddock over there. None get special treatment. And then they're weighed and they're compared and they've got this, you've got this beautiful big bell curve that you might see if you're collecting any data. And naturally, most of the animals fit around the, uh, the average. But then what we want, if we're selecting, we want to select the ones on the right-hand side, the ones that are higher, you know, higher growth or more use, or, uh, more kids or um, more eye muscle depth. And with all of that, we put it into a very complex mixed model equation. Now we can see that why, no, I won't do that to you. <laughs> um, so at the moment, the goat industry are driving old Fergie around. You have this technology sitting here. You've got the GPS, you've got the big tractors, you've got the, um, the auto steer, you've got the variable, blo variable rate, wh whatevers. So all the infrastructure is sitting there. We have geneticists, we've got DNA testing, we've got all these things, but we're still stuck up here. Now, I know there's a lot of, you know, I shouldn't be comparing sheep and goats. Sheep were driving the Fergie not that long ago. Well, they have rapidly moved along. And the goats, for me, is the next frontier as a geneticist. So, some practical advice for people who are buying bucks. Number one, structurally sound. They need to be structurally sound. When you go to the sale, don't do anything different. You look at them, yep. You need to have a defined breeding objective. What, what traits, is it, litis, is it survival, litter size, is it growth? What traits will increase profitability in your production system? Look for kid plan breeding values. There are a handful of studs, and I know it's limited to boars at the moment, but at the, at the end of the day, if I'm, if I'm breeding animals, I want a sure bet. At the very least, I want to keep up with inflation. Because remember how I said we've got um, compound interest in genetic gain? We've got compound interest in genetic loss. And at the moment, there's a whole lot of breeding uh, that's happening that it's not being measured. So where is it going? It's going somewhere. But because we're not measuring it and quantifying it and working out what, what's going on, we've got, we're, we've got a blindfold on as an industry. Apart from the handful of people who are in kid plant and know, um, uh, who are getting an estimate of their true genetic merit. So I just want to go back one step. Just because they've got breeding values does not mean that they're good. Breeding values are simply a, a genetic, genetic benchmark or a ranking of first to worst. So just because you go to a sale and you see, and you say, oh, that guy in Burke, who's a bit crazy, he said breeding values are good. Well, breeding values are good at giving you a benchmark. So what, we can go into it a little bit more a bit later, but those numbers might go, well, there's a lot of numbers. But we can put these numbers into percentiles, and we know that this example here is sitting in the bottom 95th percentile of the population. This guy is in the top 1 percentile of the population. So we can always put things back into percentiles. We all understand percentiles. Either did the HSC or know someone who did the HSC. Next thing, tip for buck buyers, do your homework prior to purchase. Don't just turn up and go, I'll get that one. There's a sale catalogue. You can go through, for those ones with with breeding bees, you can go through the sale catalogue and actually go put it, start putting lines. So there might be 200 and you do your homework and you go and do it over a glass of red wine or a, or a beer or a, um, 
glass of water and just stroke through, put a line through anything that doesn't look good. No, low fertility, no, low growth, no, I don't want that one. So if there's 200 at the sale, you can then make a short list of 40. Now people who I, who I help out with this for sheep and beef say that I've, I've ruined their sale experience because they love to go and look at the, you know, all of them and, oh, that's a beautiful one, but it turns out all the beautiful ones are not the ones that they, you know, have the right genetics. They've just been on a grain bin. So do your homework. Remember, 25%, one night or two nights of homework isn't that much. Pay for advice. I can't stress that one enough. If you don't know how to benchmark your business, you employ John. If you can't muster all your goats, you hire some um, contract musterers. If this is just uh, bends your mind, there are people out there that will charge between $100 and $150 an hour, and take a few, few of their hours, 500 bucks, and they can help step you through this. And the carrot is, a conservative carrot is $2 per year per doe, increased production. The one cool thing is, there was a fellow called James Ky named James Kyges, and he said rangeland does are the most genetically diverse animals or species on the planet, or domestic species. Now the cool thing and exciting about that is, if we want genetic improvement, we need variation. And when you have the most diverse range and breed um, sitting on your back doorstep, well, this is a very conservative number, especially as the um, value of goat continues to rise. Tips for buck breeders. Structural soundness doesn't stay. Pay for advice, upskill. And I've got a, a nice little graph that shows why it's worth upskilling. Have a defined breeding objective. No different to the commercial guys. And there's one other thing. Who, hands up who's breeding their own bucks. Yep. You guys, who I feel probably most nervous for in terms of breeding direction. If I can just go rogue for a second. Can I uh, pull this out? Um, so if this, is, if this is your population, right, you have a little um, uh, buck breeding nucleus, I'm sure. This is, nod your head if that's right. Yep. So you've, you've, you find your top does, and then you breed your bucks, and they, they mate all these ones, right? So you go probably go to a sale and buy a beautiful looking buck, or some bucks, so you guys are pinning your hopes on a small handful of bucks. Now we know that the bucks that you buy um, will send you in a direction. So it's gene flow, the, the bucks are bred, they multiply out, and these, this is your multiplying um, revenue. So if you get this, so for you guys, you need to make sure that it's a sure bet. Now that's why I feel really nervous for you. If you're buying bucks and they've got no breeding base, you know no history about them, they just look pretty, you're raffle ticket breeding. They could be good, they could be bad, and you'll never know if you're not measuring. So for you guys, I would highly recommend to go and pay someone to help you through it because if you're going downwards like that, John will have kittens over there. We need to be going up like that and making sure whether it's um, kid survival or, or growth, if that's what you're into, each year your buck team is getting better and we're making sure that those superior genetic genetics are then being multiplied out through your commercial multipliers. So I feel really nervous for you guys, I honestly do. It's a bit like asking, if you went to the bank and you said, here's a million bucks, and the bank manager said, yep, no worries. You can have 5% interest, 
or you can have a range from 5 to minus 5%. Which one are you taking? It's a no-brainer. It's the same with um, making, buying your bucks. And so if it's me, I'm going for a sure bet rather than sticking my hand up, paying 10 grand for a buck and then not having any idea of what it's capable of or what it's progeny are going to be capable of. So for buck breeders, um, there's no one here that are, are, are breeding bucks to sell, but um, my clickers stopped working. So there are key pillars of creating um, breeding values. We need to be careful on correlated selection. What the hell is correlated selection? So we know that there's, when we select for traits, there's give and take. So if we went hard on growth, we wanted bigger, you know, bigger media wieners. We know that the correlated response is the birth rate, birth weight goes with it. We can't separate the two unless we're out chasing kids that have and, and um, weighing them, birth weighing them, and then actively trying to select the low birth, lower birth weights with the high growth rates. You know, similar as um, you know your low birth weight bulls. Um, if we don't pull it apart birth weights will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now what happens as the, the size of the lamb, of the kid keeps on getting bigger, we will start potentially running into dystochia issues. At the moment, dystochia issues in goats aren't so much of a problem. But if you go hard on growth, I can guarantee you the birth weight of your kids go up. And the other thing I'd just like to say, change is coming. Um, the consumer demand for uh, breeding values, it is right through the, all the other industries. And as corporates get more involved, you know, and they need to benchmark, there will be demand for stud producers to be having breeding values. Breeding values to get into can be scary, which is why I always say, pay for the advice, upskill. So breeding values are built on, on pillars, and if we don't have these key pillars, the house starts to fall down. It doesn't fall down immediately, but we start getting breeding values that don't start making sense, and we lose confidence in the system. You got your photo? So here's a nice little slide about upskilling. So I'm at the end of a, running a five-year project with a group of merino breeders who had historically low rates of genetic gain. And uh, the five-year average, the blue line, I'm sorry, the, uh, the um, legend's a bit small there, but from 2012 to 2017 in the blue was their rate of genetic gain um, uh, prior to the project. And then the orange is during the project. Now, I bunched these breeders into um, in an unbiased fashion. It was subjective, but I thought I was pretty black and white about it. So group one was they're fully engaged. They're turning up to workshops, they're getting on the phone. I had 30% of my time committed. It was emails, phone calls, workshops. Group two were, um, were engaged, so they turned up to most stuff, but not everything. And then group three were either not very engaged or not engaged at all. And we can see the blue difference is not all that much, but what we can see is the level of engagement um, we had far more higher rates of gain. So that's a message for you guys, and it's really good that you've taken the time to come off farm or from your business to be here today, because you're upskilling. Um, and then obviously there's all the social things to go with it, networking and, and whatnot. But what we can see is the more that you upskill, the more time you put into it, the more time you talk to like-minded people, talk to uh, professionals, we can see that we get, that there is more, um, there is more uh, incentive and motivation to, to, we, to be improving. Uh, and this is just a slide that I put together. We just need to be careful of those correlated responses to selection. So future research and development. So uh, when I became part of the GOAT, um, came into the GOAT industry thanks to Trudy and Gordy, and I just want to say you guys are super lucky to have those guys sitting there. Um, they're super passionate and they really know their stuff. 
um, and they're slowly educating me on, on what's, what's happening um, at Westview. So one of the questions was, um, that came from the gallery when we were coming up with goat research projects in genetics was, we want to know what the best cross over the fer you know, over a feral doe is. What's a good second cross? And the answer is, we don't know. There's been no research done. We don't know what a feral doe is capable of. You know, we talk about, well, you know, uh, you know Paul said earlier, um, you know, are we going to trade out the, you know, the, the hardiness and the survivability of a, of a, range, of a feral doe, or, sorry, rangeland doe, if we start introducing the meat breeds? Is a Kalahari red actually better than a boar? We don't know. What I can tell you is, you'll have all sorts of variation where they overlap. There will be feral does or feral bucks that have progeny that grow every bit as good as your boars or your reds. Um, there will be there will be boars and reds that survive just as well out and just as bad out here in, in the in the tougher rangeland conditions. But we need to manage them, and we need to form reference populations. So we actually put in a project, it was a, almost a $4 million project. It was awarded by MLA, and then there was a, a costing change, um, a costing policy change within the department, and we are now looking for $900,000. So if there are any wealthy benefactors out there in the crowd, come and see me at lunchtime, please. Um, but it's a super important project because we can't answer any of those questions for you guys. Um, and I'll just park that because one of the, one of the good things about the project would um, provide a link into, for Kalahari's to get into the kid plan database. Because um, at the moment it's just boars and it seems like Kalahari's don't want to make boars and we need some common size used uh, so we can get some cross contamination between the flocks to estimate across flock um, differences for breeding values. So you can't improve what you don't measure. Asterix and record pedigree, date of birth, birth stock, rear stock, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, it, you know, that, that's, that's the crux of it. If, you, if you're not measuring for it, you can't measure for it and you can't select for it. And if your sourcing studs are not doing that, then you've got no idea where, what direction you're going in. You're just, you're floating. I don't know if you're going up or you're going down. Um, but if I was buying, I would want some, um, I'd want to be assured that it's matching the direction I want to go. In.